This is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal technology, innovation in the legal industry, and the impact tech is having on the law. I'm Chad Main, the founder of legal services company Percipient. And on today's show, I have a conversation with Professor Mark Lemley. He's the director of Stanford's program in law, science, and technology. He and I talk about whether there should be an exception to copyright law to permit AI companies to use other people's IP to train their models. One of the more interesting things about this new AI boom is that companies like Twitter, Reddit, and Getty Images that own a big chunk of the data that AI companies are using to train their models are now grumbling about the fact that these AI companies are going to charge for their products. But it does raise a good question. If you're the owner of the intellectual property that is used to train an AI model, what does that mean? Are you entitled to any kind of compensation? To date, the answer has pretty much been no, and it doesn't seem like that's going to change anytime soon. But maybe it should be that way because of the benefits AI will yield and the impossibility of tracking down millions of IP owners to get their permission to train your AI model. My guest today is Professor Mark Lemley of Stanford. He's the director of the school's program in law, science, and technology. Professor Lemley believes that copyrighted works used to train AI should fall under the fair use exception to copyright law. But what is fair use? Well, courts use a four-factor balancing test to figure out if someone else's use of a copyright is fair. What they look at is the purpose and the character of the use, whether it's a commercial use or whether it's for a nonprofit use, such as educational purposes. Courts also look at the nature of the copyrighted work. They also look at the amount of the original work that's copied. And finally, they take a look at the effect of the new use on the potential market for the value of the original copyrighted work. Fair use cases you might be familiar with are like political parodies from Saturday Night Live or educational uses in schools and universities. What Professor Lemley is proposing is what he calls a fair learning exemption to copyright law. He even wrote a law review article about it a couple years ago in the Texas Law Review. As we will hear today from Professor Lemley, another important factor that courts use to figure out whether something is fair use goes a little above and beyond the four-factor test I mentioned before, and that's whether the second use is transformative. Coincidentally, a few days after Professor Lemley and I spoke, the United States Supreme Court handed down a fair use opinion that weighed in on this transformative use issue. At issue there was Andy Warhol's use of a photographer's picture of Prince. Initially, the photographer had granted Warhol permission for a one-time use of the photo to make paintings. Well, fast forward to 2016, and she finds out that Condé Nast had commissioned 16 pieces of art based on her photo from Andy Warhol's estate. The Supreme Court sided with the photographer and found that the use of the photographer's copyright by Andy Warhol's estate was not fair use. Many legal analysts out there that are much more well-versed in IP law than I seem to think that this opinion may have an impact on the question of whether it's okay to use someone else's IP to train AI. Personally, I'm not so sure. It seems like there are just as many questions now after the opinion as there was before. But hey, that's why I brought Professor Lemley on the show to talk about this issue. As noted, he's currently a professor at Stanford, and before that, a teaching gigs at Cal in Texas. Oh, and he's also the co-founder of Lex Machina. That's a legal analytics company that Lexus and Nexus bought a while back. When I was getting ready for the podcast and looking at Professor Lemley's resume, something stuck out to me. The whole while he's been teaching, he's been actively practicing law. Not that that's super unusual, especially if you're an adjunct professor, but generally when you're a full-blown professor like Professor Lemley, practicing law is generally like a side gig. Just a few months ago in January this year, Professor Lemley took on a new position at Lex Lumina. That's an IP firm. And interestingly, he's not the only professor in the practice. I practiced for several years before I went into teaching, but I've been working on a textbook while I was in practice. And my final year in practice, I taught as an adjunct and loved it, decided this is what I wanted to do, but I also didn't want to sort of give up the connection to what's going on in the real world. And I think it's, especially in a field like I work in, right, technology, law, it's easy to fall behind, right? And, you know, be talking about things that no one in the real world is actually worrying about anymore. I didn't want that to happen. And right now you're the director of both the Law Science and Technology program and the LM program for the same discipline. You're at Stanford now, but you're also with a law firm called Lex Lumina. And I took a look at that firm. Looks like most, if not all of you are also professors, but, and that's kind of your angle, right? How did that come to be? That's a relatively recent development. I just joined January 1st. I've been with one firm or another my entire career. The law firm that we founded 15 years ago, Duritangri, ended up merging with a big firm at the end of the year last year. And for the kind of practice that I have, that didn't seem like the thing I wanted to do. So yeah, this is a great group. There are six of us, five of us are law professors. That obviously means there are 
some kinds of cases we're not going to be taken on, right? We don't have a lot of staff support, but what we've got is a sort of great, smart group of people who kind of think up interesting new ways to solve problems. Was that the goal to have a law firm that was generally comprised of professors or that is coincidence? It just happened that way. I don't think it's something that we sort of insist on, right? It's more, I mean, these are people who kind of know each other, who've worked together and have a kind of intellectual interest in trying to make intellectual property and tech law better. And, you know, it's the firm's only a year and a half old and we'll see what happens from there. But uh, but it's going pretty well so far. And your practice there is in IP. It's in tech. It's also antitrust. How did you get interested in IP specifically? I know that morphs over to tech because a lot of tech is IP, but why the interest in IP? Yeah, I actually came into IP from the antitrust side. So I had an economics degree as an undergrad. I came to law school interested in antitrust. And when I graduated law school a really long time ago now, antitrust was dying and IP was just starting to take off. And so I did some work on the intersection between the two and that got me interested in IP. But most of my work has been in IP over the last 30 years. You were recently quoted in a New York Times article talking about P tension, for lack of a better word, between copyright holders and AI that are using some of their works. Tell us a little bit about that tension. Like, what is the underlying issue there between these new large language models, just AI in general, that are using all this copyrighted data and the vis-a-vis the rights of the owners? So you've got a couple of different issues, right? So the one that we're sort of seeing lawsuits filed on right now has to do with whether it's permissible to train your AI using somebody else's copyrighted work. But we'll see how the cases come out. But I think the law is actually pretty clear in the United States that I can make a copy of your work internally in my computer system if the thing that I'm doing with it is not using it, producing output that's similar to yours, but but using it for some other productive purpose. So Google Books, for instance, Google scanned all the books out of the world's major libraries so it could create a certain engine of books. It's got a database that it made of everybody's copyrighted works, but the court said that's fair use because your goal is not to provide books in competition with them. It's to sort of create this search database. And I think here too, courts are going to say it's fine to train a data set on all of the text on the internet or all of the images you can pull down from the internet, as long as you're not using it to generate output that is too similar to any one of those works. And the cases that we've seen so far are not, in fact, cases where the plaintiffs allege, hey, your model is generating output that's too similar to our works. Everybody seems to agree that the images are coming out of mid-journey, for instance, or are different than anything that went in. They're not a copy of a particular thing. I think there will be a second set of cases, right? Every once in a while, AI does generate something that looks really similar to one of the inputs, and there are probably going to be some litigation around that. Sometimes that's because the user prompts it to do so. Sometimes it's because there is a canonical image that also happens to be copyrighted. So there are millions of pictures of Baby Yoda out there in the world. And so the AI sort of understands Baby Yoda as a concept. And if you ask it to render Baby Yoda, it will give you a very accurate picture of Baby Yoda. But I think those are going to be individual cases where the question is, is your work too similar to mine? This first line of cases about training really is about whether we can have this generative AI model at all. Right. It's hot and heavy now because LLMs have, over the last six months, have have grown in in usage. But you previewed this issue a couple of years ago in the Texas Law Review. You have an article called Fair Learning. And basically, to to sum up in one sentence, is you think that the use of these large language models, the AI, to be trained on copyrighted data should be part of the fair use doctrine. So before we get in the whys and hows that would work specifically for AI, give a quick overview of what fair use is in copyright law. Copyright law reaches pretty broadly, right? I mean, people think of, oh, you know, somebody copied someone else's song or made a TV show that's too similar. But a copyright also ends up covering a bunch of things you and I do every day right? Sort of, you know, walking through the park and playing music, right? Or kind of taking notes in a book or something of that nature. And the fair use doctrine is designed to say, 
not everything that involves the making of a copy should be illegal. Uh, and in particular, if we feel like the thing you are doing in making a copy is not replacing the copyright owner's work, uh, taking a sale away from them, but is allowing you to build something new to make something transformative, that's something that benefits the world and we want to allow it. Give an example of a transformative work that is a fair use. Because, you know, I just can't start making Baby Yoda Grigu dolls and changing the color. Right. That, that's transformative, but right. not protected. So an example is parody, for instance. So there's a U.S. Supreme Court case called Campbell versus Act of Rose, where a rap group decided to make a kind of song that was a sort of mocking version of Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman. Roy Orbison sued, and the court said... Yeah, you took some of the copyrighted work in your song, but you did it for a different purpose. You did it to kind of tell a different story, to make fun of Roy Orbison, and we don't want to prohibit that. And a lot of times the fair use relates to some sort of public interest in the use, right? Education, parody, that's political commentary, right? Right. So among the things that could be fair use are scholarship or research, right? I can quote materials. I can include a picture in my articles to make a point, I can use examples from real cases that are real images when I teach my classes, right? And again, all of those things are, we view those as not substituting for a sale that the copyright owner lost. We view it as providing some productive new value to the world. Technically Legal is presented by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal and compliance teams with legal operations, corporate compliance, and process automation. We can assist with managed document review, electronic discovery, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and we can also help develop process-driven legal workflows. To learn more, visit percipient.co, percipient.co. Percipient, legal services powered by technology. When we come back in just a minute, Professor Lemley explains why he thinks there should be a fair learning exception to copyright law, which is very similar to the concept of fair use, but it applies to AI companies in their use of copyrighted material to train their models. He explains why it's probably impossible for AI developers to go out and secure millions of licenses for the copyrighted works that they use. And he also points out that if using copyrighted work to train AI is considered a fair use, it means there will be more data available to train the models, which means they'll be more accurate and they'll be less biased. I'm Chad Main, and you're listening to Technically Legal. We'll get back to my conversation with Professor Wembley in just a second, but before we do, as I always do, I want to let you know if you go to tlpodcast.com, there's an episode page dedicated to every episode we do. There'll be links to more information about our guests and more information about some of the stuff we talk about. If you want to get a hold of me, you can email me at cmain at percipient.co, that's C-M-A-I-N at percipient.co, or you can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. All right, let's get back to my conversation with Stanford's Professor Mark Lemley. Your argument in the article, Fair Learning, is a lot of it is based on public interest. Because number one, you say, practically speaking, it's infeasible for these large language models to go out and get licenses from the millions, if not billions, of copyrighted works. Because the vast majority of stuff they are learning on is copyrighted. But you also say that there's a public interest in allowing them access because it makes better AI. It makes it more accurate. It makes it less biased. So it's kind of within the spirit of the fair use doctrine, right? Yeah, absolutely. You're not actually replacing a sale, right? The picture the AI generates doesn't look anything like the picture that went in. You're doing something valuable for the world by allowing a better training and allowing the creation of this new work. And I think there's one other consideration, which I talk about in the paper, which is particularly a large language model usually isn't interested in your prose as prose, it's interested in understanding how language works, right? It's interested in how words are strung together, and so it can actually do its own stringing of words together. And in that sense, the language model is doing what we all do as humans, which is it's learning by looking at examples and experience, right? It's, it's learning to write by reading. It's learning to paint by looking at the masters or copying the masters. And as long as the thing that it produces at the end of the day is new and not just a copy from the original, right, that's something we encourage. Explain that too, because that's one of your arguments true, is that you note that lately, over the last, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 years, Fair use, a lot of it, the analysis on whether work is transformative. But your argument is also that the use 
of training AI on copyrighted material is also transformative. But how so? Because you also admit it's copying everything. Yeah. And so we've seen kind of two strands of transformative use in the copyright cases. One is I changed your work. I took your song and I kind of rewrote it to tell a different story. But the other is transformative purpose. So here I might take the actual entirety of your copyrighted work, but I'm using it in a way and for a purpose that's very different than yours. So uh, two examples, image search engines, right? Image search engines have thumbnails. They have kind of like small scale versions of the images. They only work because I can make a small thumbnail of the image to enable people to find the image they're looking for. The court says, yeah, even though you made a copy of the whole picture, you did it for a completely different purpose than to interfere with the market for the copyright owner. And the other example, I think, comes from software. So the Supreme Court two years ago in the Google versus Oracle case said you can copy code necessary to write a program APIs that are interoperable with the Java uh, language. So Google can implement its own code to be compatible with Java, even though in doing so, it's got to copy some of the outline and structure of the Java code. It makes that copy, but it's making that copy for a new use that isn't competing with Java. It's expanding it to the phone market. And that's what you say in the article, too. The transformative use that AI is using, it's going to the facts. It doesn't care how something was written. It doesn't care that a fact is in a John Grisham book, if, if there is. Yep. It cares about getting to the nitty gritty. How is that transformative, though? Because we're using it to sort of train the model, which is then going to make a bunch of things that are not infringing. Right. And so I think that's the real value. Right. What I'm interested in is kind of learning from this and then creating something new. And that's what copyright law wants to encourage. I will note that won't always be true. Right. If I decided to sort of train a Taylor Swift bot and I trained it only on Taylor Swift songs and I had it make new music, it might make new music that seems pretty similar to a Taylor Swift song. That could end up being a problem, right? So if I'm actually creating something that's truly new, that's not just a copy from anybody, that's something we want to encourage. But if I end up sort of just replicating a copyrighted work or something very much like it, that's a problem. I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you because let's use the Taylor Swift example. If I'm understanding you right in your argument about AI is looking for the fact. It doesn't care the context it's in or the prose or how beautifully written it is. But in this situation where you talk about music and specifically Taylor Swift, the fact is how Taylor Swift sounds. So if I want to generate AI that makes songs sound like right. Taylor Swift, that's the fact. And it is actually copying it. Is it transformative because it sounds like her? Maybe people couldn't distinguish. I think this is going to be a hard case, right? Because it's probably making a new song, right? It is unlikely to actually be generating a Taylor Swift song. But if you give it something that narrow as a constraint, it might be generating something that kind of sounds and has the lyric and note structure very much like a Taylor Swift song. And there may be enough similarity there that we want to say the thing you're producing is not itself new and transformative. It's mostly derivative of existing songs. It's a great example from two weeks ago where an AI generated a song that purported to be a Drake and The Weeknd collaborating together. Uh, it wasn't, but it sounded like them. It was kind of written in the, in the sort of style, if you were to merge the two of them. You know, it's creative in a sense, but it's also something that sort of potentially problematic because Drake says, hey, this is out there purporting to be one of my songs and it isn't. You know. Taylor Swift is actually a good example, too, because she probably wishes this AI was released a couple years ago because she went back and re-recorded all her songs. So she could have done that with less work. But, right. I mean, that's kind of just being facetious there. But it relates to a bigger point you make in your article is that the real test in these kind of circumstances are going to be whether it displaces the commercial use of the original or competes with the commercial use of the original copyright. Exactly. And so if, in fact, we're producing output that's too similar to an original work, we've got a problem. I've been working with some folks in the computer science department here at Stanford. So one of the things that we've found is that this almost never happens with images or text search on its own, but you can prompt it to happen. 
So if you ask uh, ChatGPT, write me a children's story about kids who go to a wizard school, it's not going to give you anything like Harry Potter. But if you ask it, write me a children's story about kids who go to a wizard school, and then that begins, and you give it the first paragraph of the first Harry Potter book, it will actually spit out a bunch of Harry Potter. Because it now recognizes, oh yeah, the thing you want is this very specific category. So that's a potential problem, right? We don't want it to generate sort of copies of Harry Potter. That's not something copyright law would protect. And I think an interesting question there is, should we blame the AI, which generates it, or should we blame the person who kind of specifically tries to get it to infringe copyright? That also presents an interesting question, too, because going back to the music example, I've seen musicians and artists out there who are embracing AI and saying, hey, this is great. It's cool if they copy my the way I play my guitar or the way I sing because they can create derivative works and sing with me. So... That's going to raise some interesting questions about copyright law there too, right? Who owns what? You know, if if I use Taylor Swift's voice to make a song and she's cool with that, you know, where does that go? Absolutely. And I think it is definitely the case that you've got a bunch of folks in Hollywood who are excited at the prospect of bringing back dead actors or right, sort of generating scores in background without having to sort of hire musicians to write them or the video game industry in particular, right? Where we're already generating everything with CGI, the ability to do it, to automate a bunch of it is I think potentially really transformative. It is also very worrisome if you're a content provider, right? right? If you're in the business of kind of writing text or acting, you know, I understand why people are concerned about the success of generative AI, right? Because they look at this and say, wow, maybe this is uh, going to compete with me, not by using my own copyrighted works, but just by sort of making art cheaply. Not too long ago, I think in this year, the Copyright Office came out with some sort of uh, direction or guidance as to what is copyrightable if it's produced by AI and correct me if I'm wrong, I think the short way of describing it is if a human contributed to the work, that's copyrightable, but whatever the machine did not copyrightable. How does that relate to, or does it not relate to, you know, what we've been talking about here is like the protections of copyright holders when AI models are learning. I think this is going to be a really interesting problem, right? So the courts have said, oh, only humans can be sort of creative authors that's going to come under a lot of stress, right? Particularly if, as we see, you know, Hollywood or the music industry turn to the use of some of this stuff. In theory, right now, if an image Dolly generates something, nobody owns it. Everybody's free to use it. My guess is once some of these things start to turn out to be very valuable, there's going to be a, a big fight about that, right? Because people are going to want to say, hey, I want to own it. They're going to want to say, no, just because I used AI to generate this background or this art, you shouldn't be able to copy that directly. We may get around it. The Copyright Office talks a little bit about saying, well, maybe the creativity can be in the way you ask the question. So if I ask it to give me a painting of penguins having a picnic on the beach, and I don't like what it does. So then I come back and I say, well, OK, but put some mountains in the background or make the water bluer. Right. And I iterate back and forth. Maybe that's enough creativity to say, well, all right, I've made authorial choices that give me the copyright. Even if we say that, it's going to look very different than the way we think of things right now. And. I think it's going to turn copyright law on its head, right? Right now, we sort of view ideas are the things you can't protect, but the particular brush strokes, the way you chose the words, those are the creative things you can protect. And I think in the future, it might well be the opposite, right? The actual generation of the image is easy. The hard part is asking the right question, right? Knowing exactly what you want that image to include. Uh, and that's what people may fight over trying to own. Professor Wemley, I appreciate your time. If people want to learn more about you or take a look at your articles, where can they go? Just come to the Stanford website. I'm pretty easy to find. And the, yeah, the paper you mentioned is called Fair Learning in the Texas Law Review. Okay, that's a wrap for today's episode. As always, we really appreciate you listening. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, etc. Also, if you like us enough, I hope you leave us a favorable review. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal.